Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Ryan Nordahl here, Epic Whitetail Habitat, LLC. I'm out on the proving grounds today. Kind of a nasty day. I didn't count on it to be this nasty, but it is what it is. And we're just going to make the most of it here on my proving grounds. Um, I'm supposed to be somewhere doing some hinge cutting today on a property and conditions just aren't right. Um, I want to play it safe, so we're just up here on my property. We're going to do some habitat manipulation, do some improvements in here. Uh, it's really windy. I know it doesn't show it up here because it's, you know, it's just the way it is. Yeah, we're on top of a ridge, but we've made it so it's not so windy right here where I'm standing. Um, just with the things that we've implemented as far as... <laughs> Hinge cutting goes to create that thermal cover. You can see there, it's kind of a nasty northeast wind, um, but you can you can see my stand right there in the background behind me. Um, what we what we do here on this property is, and what I've done in the past is, we set our stands and then we build around it. Any good habitat manager, Steve Bartella, Jeff Sturgis, Tony LaPratt, Randy Vanderveen, um, Jake Eulinger, even my friend Sam Tunberg up in Minnesota, they'll always say, you pick your stand sites first, then you build around it. And it couldn't be more true. Um, it's just something that we've, you know, that we've learned here on our property. It's nothing new that we've discovered. It's just common sense. Pick out your stands and then manipulate the deer to move where we want them to move. This mock scrape right here that we set up last year was a very active scrape. We had multiple bucks on it. Um, we had a buck that was living right back here. We know he was living here just because of the multitude of pictures we had on, on here. But the one thing we learned about this property, and we've always known it, but we're gonna become more disciplined about it here going forward in 2024 and in the future. This property, what we've learned, especially through the habitat manipulation that we've done on here, is that this property, you have to get in in the morning and you have to sit all day. Early season, we're not hunting this. Unless our cameras tell us different for them first couple days, we're not going to hunt this at all until the end of October when things are for the most part, right for this property. But again, this property sets up for all day sits. The only place that we could possibly get in is our north northwest corner. Uh, the wind has to be right. It swirls down in that bottom, so we have to be really careful. Um, it sets up great for a blind location, be it a pop-up blind. I'd love to get a permanent blind in there just to help conceal our scent that much more. You'll never beat a deer's nose, I understand that. But at the same time, I'm gonna use the things that I can to help reduce my scent that we leave on the ground, but setting that up for northwest wind, especially, or not for northwest wind, it has to be any south wind, primarily east. East would be a great wind. They're gonna come into that plot like they have. It's a great opportunity to come in either to do a doe hunt or my ultimate goal with that northwest corner, that little food plot down there that we call the logging landing. It's going to be a clover plot. We're going to do some um, dirty bird from Domain Outdoors down in there too, just for a late season source, very low impact hunting opportunity. Late in the season next year, but uh, I think that mix of clover in there early season, especially when that youth hunt rolls around first part of October to get uh, He'll be seven years old this fall. Um, he's seven now, but he'll be seven come this fall. My little boy in there and have a youth season opportunity if uh, we don't get invited like we did this past year to hunt uh, another property somewhere. But uh, that's just what we're doing here. And uh, we're just making things better. Um, we're going against the green, but it's just some things that we've learned this year. We've picked out a couple other spots that I've always wanted to get stands in just wasn't sure how it would set up I kindly I finally kind of figured it out this past year we've got to have stands in these two locations we've got the trees picked out 
We're going to manipulate the habitat around to create some great pinch point setups, mock scrapes, and I think it's going to be a slam dunk where both my buddy and I, perhaps one of my kids, can get into both of these setups at the same time early in the morning. We plan on sitting all day, and uh, I think they're going to work great just the way they set up the, from where the deer are coming from early in the morning off the ag fields to our south. And... Uh, get that all day cruising line through there, even when the pressure is on from the neighbors. Not that we're trying to, you know, compete with our neighbors, but yet at the same time we are, you know, we're not, we're not blocking deer flow out to the field, but we're creating it so when the neighbors come in, scaring the deer back into us and that line of movement on the back side of those bedding areas is where we want to be yeah we got to come through the property and that's why we have to come in early in the morning and we sit all day long dark to dark or unless we kill something then we can get out of here but if we're hunting together a couple of us are hunting together then we've got to stay till dark if we kill even if we kill something we're not going to go in and get it out of here until the cover of darkness because in theory that's when all the deer should be out of here and then we leave it alone think we can do this this year where we come in one two maybe three days if possible hunt and get the hell out of here we got plenty of other private land that we can hunt um, we're even going to take more advantage of some of the public ground around but we're going to keep the pressure off of this and we're going to pull some deer off from here this year we've got some good ones hanging around we, we're going to make it better so this is where they come back to bed at least um, they wipe us out on food all the time especially with the ag fields to the south here they come up here they stage and they just wipe us out but as long as we've got the daylight cover in here that's all that matters because he's gonna bet he's gonna feed three times in his bedding area and if we can control that daylight movement in here when he's back in his bedding area we get that late october cold front that swings through it's going to set up perfect. It has in the past. It's worked great in the past. We're just going to make it a lot better, I feel, this year going into 2024. So that's what we're up here doing today. Follow along and you can see what we're doing. Now, when it comes to managing your property for whitetails, you have to think outside the box. And you have to have an open mind when it comes to timber. I understand there's a lot of timber value on properties. I also understand that junk trees, and you've heard me talk about this in other videos, and you'll hear other people talk about it too in their videos as well, some very notable habitat managers and consultants. You know, a box elder is worthless. Basswood are basically worthless. There's other trees in other parts of the country that are considered worthless. And junk, and you should just get rid of them. You should, you should cut them down or you hack and squirt them, kill them, get them out of here. You know, it's a, can be, the same can be said with prickly ash, the same can be said with um, buckthorn, things like, it all has its place. Autumn olive, bush honeysuckle. It all has its place. Yes, in areas where you're trying to manage the timber for future timber harvest, yes, indeed, it has to be taken out. It has to be eliminated. But in terms of a whitetail and wildlife, they're excellent wildlife trees. In terms of whitetail deer, browse. To me, and you'll hear other people say it as well, but even in my own experience, You'll always find deer are browsing heavily on box elder shoots, new shoots from basswood, these silver maple that are in here. These silver maple are basically worthless. We gotta put this cover down in the deer's face. You can see how brushy it is in here. The rabbits, the grouse, they're thanking me. We're getting all this new regeneration. These are basswood shoots that are coming right here. Those are basswood shoots. What else have we got in here? We've got blackberry briar. Deer love to browse on blackberry briar. We've also got, um, that's box elder canes right here. You could actually cut them down a little bit and get new fresh growth to come. 
There's also back over here, there's elderberry bush, all great. Yeah, they can significantly take over your property if you're trying to manage it for timber. I'm not trying to manage for timber on my property. I'm trying to manage for deer and wildlife. Yeah, you can have a balance. Yes, we are saving our white oaks. The black oaks hopefully soon will come out of here for our, tim our own timber management plan on this property. But you gotta open up that canopy, guys. That's a larger canopy than what the video is showing right now. Within a year's time, I'm gonna get a lot of stump sprouts off these basswood and silver maple that I've cut in here. The cherry as well that we've cut. A lot of them I've taken right off. Some of them we've been able to successfully hinge cut, as you can see. They're even a little bit larger than I'd like to hinge cut. No, they may not stay alive forever, but they're gonna do some stump sprouts. You're gonna get some vertical shoots that come off of these logs, off of these basswood. Same with the silver maple back here, the same with the cherry that's back here. New successional hardwood regeneration. This is a bedding area that's starting to come together in just a short period of time. I think we started, started cutting this quite a few years ago. But two years ago I come up here and really did a heavy hinge cut. Lots of flush cuts because there's just... A lot of my trees were like these big maple right here. So a lot of flush cutting and then hinge cutting on, behind that with the smaller trees. This trail right here that I'm on, you can see this trail heavily used right now coming out of the bottom. It can also come out this way. It's pretty thick in here right now. I'm gonna have to cut a little bit more, so a little bit easier walking. So right up through here, I'm gonna have to get my steel weed trimmer with a blade on it. I'm cut a lot of these brambles and briars back. All comes together, another trail right here, comes up along the rim here. And right out, we cut a hole through this log. Yeah, we've got some, got some prickly ash here. They've been browsing on it. Some prickly ash is good, it has to be managed. Sought after deer browse, you can see all these buds here have been nipped on. And come right out. There's our mock scrape. We got the licking branch pointed back. There's our stand. They can either exit this trail here or they can exit down the hollow to the south down here. We're gonna get in here, we're gonna take some of this hackberry, take some of these elderberry, cut them back, get new new growth. Down into deer's face, you can see this is all new. I did not do any of this. They were reaching up to browse it. You can see where they broke off. Highly sought after deer browse on this property. I want more of it. There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. The deer love it. It's all about creating diverse habitat. You gotta think of what a deer prefers for browse. You gotta watch, you gotta study. I know I'm probably repeating myself to a lot of you, but it cannot be driven home enough. You have to think in terms of deer and other wildlife that are gonna benefit from doing things like this. I understand that it's highly dangerous, and a lot of you loggers possibly watching this don't like what I'm doing, but what I'm doing out here is working and it's working a heck of a lot faster than coming up here and doing a clear cut or a select harvest, anything like that for logging. I, I'm all for putting money in your pocket, having a logging project done. In fact, I was in a property out in Western New York about a week ago and they wanted me to come out and do some hinge cutting. When I got on the property, it was obvious. A lot of large timber. Lots of large timber, not desirable trees for hinge cutting. They're great trees in terms of the species for hinge cutting, but as far as the size goes, 
there they can put some money in their pocket to offset the cost of the new destination. Food plot we're putting on the property, stands, and other things that I suggested to do on the property as well. I want them to do a log, take a logging harvest off of there before I would go in and make a mess. Because what I'm going to do, yeah, it is going to make a mess to the human eye. But to a deer's eye, we can manipulate deer where we want them to go in accordance to deer stand. Again, this mock scrape got a lot more activity this year because of the things we've done. The way we've fallen this, these trees, creating these little pinch points up in here. This is a great little hidden kill plot up in here. I don't always recommend sitting on a food plot, but this is a great little, it's about a quarter acre is all this is. It's not a large destination food source where we're gonna scare deer out of here. These deer are basically on their way out long before we ever think of getting down and out of the stand for the most part. But we can slip out of here, we can slip up in here, we can slip down out of here using the ridge to our advantage. Yeah, it's a bedding area over here, but there's a hollow in this northeast corner back here, we can come up that northeast hollow, we can exit that northeast hollow. Hunting this stand on a southwest wind. Options, you gotta have the options. Pick out your stands, know the wind direction, build the habitat around that stand location. It can be done. Deer are some of the easiest animals to manipulate their movement and set up for a great ambush. Of all the trees, I think hackberry is probably my favorite tree to hinge cut. You can see the stump sprouts off of here. Now, what do we do? I cut this a little bit too high, really didn't know what I was doing. This is about mm, a little less than chest high on me. It's probably about right to the bottom of my sternum here. You can see all the stump sprouts off of here, but it's time to put these on the ground or at least bend them over. Deer can still get underneath here. But look at all these little shoots coming up here. Every one of them's browsed on. You can see this hackberry tree here. It's still alive. You can see the shoots coming off of it. Some of these smaller hackberry, we're going to tip over and we're going to get the same thing to go. But you can see down in here these ha hackberry shoots. They're all nipped off. Deer love hackberry for browse. So let's get these big shoots down and get some more re regeneration to pop. Now I know in a lot of my videos, and you'll hear other guys talk about it too, depth of cover, it's not always the case. That's one thing I learned in the last couple of years, and a good friend of mine, fellow habitat manager up in northern Minnesota, northwest Minnesota, Sam Tumberg, um, kind of reinforced this with me. It's not always about depth of cover, it's about security. Deer doesn't always, you know, we, we talk about that layering effect, layering your does and your fawns closer to food sources. Up here, this micro food plot, these bucks can be anywhere. And it was proven in 2023 with, with the general. He's just a three-year-old, he's four-year-old this year. He might be somebody that we're after here in 2024. I'd love to see him get one more year. Um, but if the neighbors get him, what, whatever, um, and I'd be half tempted myself probably. But it's about security. We took this hackberry back here, took the tops down. Now, I understand, I'm fully aware, I don't need the criticism that deer relate more to side cover than they do overhead cover, but it is also my experience, I've seen a lot of bucks, a lot of big bucks, especially when we're making drives on public land, 
pop out of little caverns like we've made here. You can see right under this hackberry tree, got a lot of overhead cover. Let me get right down in here. I'll take and I'll rake this out a little later this spring. Today I want to get out of here. I'm soaking wet. It's miserable. Our stand location is right back here. When this is full of leaves, these elderberry, believe it or not, are still going to hold their leaves right at the end of October. They're going to give us a lot of cover in here. These hackberry. So there's a lot of vineage, everything. But we're getting up in that stand early, early in the morning. We're talking an hour and a half, two hours before daylight. He comes up in here from the neighbors, wherever he's at. He comes in here to bed. He's never going to know that we're there as long as we're playing the wind right. We may get away with a northwest wind the way this sets up, but I don't think so. Just the way the deer travel back and forth, east and west, on this ridge top, where our safest wind is either straight west, southwest, or straight out of the south. We blow out over the ridge behind us here, but he comes up in here, lays down in here, comes out to the food plot behind us, gets a bite to eat, checks this mock scrape that's out here. It's a slam dunk. We've got him. We're going to put a camera in here this summer and just see what happens. Now this is set up more for fall. But these deer on this property tend to stick around for the most part as long as we keep the pressure off. That's the key. We keep the pressure off of here. These deer will summer here and they'll be here in the fall as well. Um, Captain Hook was a prime example, a deer that summered on the property. And we killed him. Yeah, he was probably still in his summer pattern because we killed him mid-September. But he was a deer that was going to stick around because the previous two seasons before that as a two-year-old and a three-year-old he stuck around on this property he summered here every year and of course it all depends on what's down on the neighbor's ag fields but he stuck around all summer that year or those years and he stuck around all fall all the way through the hunting seasons and into late season as well he was a homebody he didn't travel far sure the older he got he might have you know traveled out of here but we capitalized on him, 160 inch 10 point that year, with a lot of junk. It was a fun deer to kill, my biggest to date, 2018. Um, but here in 2024, with the General, um, with Triple T, bucks of that nature, Triple T is going to be a phenomenal five and a half year old this year. We've had such an easy winter here in Wisconsin, now going into spring. Now in the spring we're getting this snow. <laughs> it's funny. But anyway, we're going to get out of here. We're soaking wet. I hope you found this a little bit educational, what we're doing. Find the stand location first. Build the habitat around it. You'll kill more bucks. I can guarantee it. And a lot of other habitat managers will say the same. White-tailed deer are some of the most easily manipulated animals there can be. You can outsmart them as long as you're smart yourself. Think outside the box. It ain't always about timber value trees. Trees like hackberry, not a lot of high timber value in it. Most would consider a junk tree, but to deer, they're like candy. They're in the maple family, and proof is in the pudding. As they say, hey guys, I hope you found this educational and helpful to help you become a better hunter here in 2024, better habitat manager as well. Thanks for joining along. God bless you all and keep living the dream.